Hey guys, welcome back to Pages of the Globe. Today I'm going to be reading to you the short story called Aaron's Gift by Myron Levoy. Now, this short story is about a kid named Aaron who has found a pigeon with its wing broken. In the story, Aaron tries to nurse the pigeon back to health by creating some splints for it and wrapping bandages around the injured wing. Now, once he's nursed it back to health, he plans to give it to his grandmother for her birthday in hopes of easing some of the pain that she has from losing her beloved goat that she had when she was a child during one of the Cossack attacks in Ukraine. So, at one point, because of pressure from a neighborhood gang that pretends to want the pigeon as a mascot, he finds himself torn between his desire to surprise his grandmother and his desire to belong in the gang. Now, I don't want to tell you guys exactly what Aaron decides to choose, so I'm going to tell you a couple facts about the author, Myron Levoy. Now, Myron Levoy was born in 1930, and I honestly don't know if he is alive because there are some sources that say he is, and there are other sources that say that he isn't. But um, if he was alive, then he would be 91 years old. He received his BS at New York City College and MSc from Purdue University. He began writing in his spare time and wrote five plays that ended up actually being produced in New York in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Soon after that, he shifted gears and crafted a tale for his son and daughter as a Hanukkah gift. That story was expanded into Levoy's first book for children, The Witch of Fourth Street and Other Stories, which was published in 1972. And this book is still in print, so you could still buy it. In his career as an author, Levoy largely focused on characters who were outsiders, creating several novels with hard-hitting themes. His most famous book would probably be Alan and Naomi, and it was published throughout Europe and Asia, and adapted as a play too, that is still performed in Germany. This book was also brought to the big screen in 1992, as the Porsche Light Entertainment feature film, Alan Naomi, starring Lucas Haas. Without further ado, let's get on with the story. Remember to like, share, subscribe, and comment down which short story you would like to hear next. Aaron's Gift by Myron Levoy Aaron Candle had come to Tompkins Square Park to roller skate for the streets near 2nd Avenue were always too crowded with children and peddlers and old ladies and baby buggies. A few children had bicycles in those days. Almost every child owned a pair of roller skates. And Aaron was, it must be said, a Class A triple fantastic roller skater. Aaron skated back and forth on the wide walkway of the park, pretending he was an aviator in an air race zooming around the pylons, which were actually two lampposts. During his third lap around the race course, he noticed a pigeon on the grass behaving very strangely. Aaron skated to the line of benches, then climbed over onto the lawn. The pigeon was trying to fly, but all it could manage was to flutter and turn round and round in a large circle, as if it were performing a frenzied dance. The left wing was only half open and was beating in a clumsy, jerking fashion. It was clearly broken. Luckily, Aaron hadn't eaten the cookies he'd stuffed into his pocket before he'd gone clinking down the three flights of stairs from his apartment, his skates already on. He broke a cookie into small crumbs and tossed some toward the pigeon. Here, Pidge! Here, Pidge! He called. The pigeon spotted the cookie crumbs and after a moment stopped thrashing about. It folded its wings as best as it could, but the broken wing still half stuck out. 
Then it strutted over to the crumbs, its head bobbing forth and back, forth and back, as if it were marching a little in front of the rest of the body, perfectly normal except for the half-open wing which seemed to make the bird stagger sideways every so often. The pigeon began eating the crumbs as Aaron quickly unbuttoned his shirt and pulled it off. Very slowly, he edged toward the bird, making little kissing sounds like the one he'd heard his grandmother make when she fed the sparrows on the back fire escape. Then, suddenly, Aaron plunged. The shirt in both hands came down like a torn parachute. The pigeon beat its wings, but Aaron held the shirt to the ground, and the bird couldn't escape. Aaron felt under the shirt gently and gently took hold of the wounded pigeon. Yes, yes, Pidge, he said very softly. That's a good boy. Good pigeon. Good. The pigeon struggled in his hands, but little by little, Aaron managed to soothe it. Good boy, Pidge. That's your new name, Pidge. I'm going to take you home, Pidge. Yes, yes. Shh. Good boy. I'm going to fix you up. Easy, Pidge. Easy does it. Aaron squeezed through an opening between the row of benches and skated slowly out of the park while holding the pigeon carefully with both hands as if it were one of his mother's rare precious cups from the old country. How fast the pigeon's heart was beating. Was he afraid or did all pigeons' hearts beat fast? It was fortunate that Aaron was an excellent skater for he had to skate six blocks to his apartment over broken pavement and sudden gratings and curbs and cobblestones. But when he reached home, he asked Noreen Callahan, who was playing on the stoop, to take off his skates for him. He would not chance going up three flights on roller skates this time. Is he sick? asked Noreen. Broken wing, said Aaron. I'm going to fix him up and make him into a carrier pigeon or something. Can I watch? asked Noreen. Watch what? The operation. I'm going to be a nurse when I grow up. Okay, said Aaron. You can even help. You can help hold him while I fix him up. Aaron wasn't certain what his mother would say about his newfound pet, but he was pretty sure he knew what his grandmother would think. His grandmother lived with them ever since his grandfather died three years ago, and she fed the sparrows and jays and crows and robins on the back fire escape with every spare crumb she could find. In fact, Erin noticed that she sometimes created crumbs where they didn't exist by squeezing and tearing pieces of her breakfast roll when his mother wasn't looking. Erin didn't really understand his grandmother, for he often saw her by the window having long conversations with the birds, telling them about her days as a little girl in the Ukraine. And once he saw her take a mirror from her handbag and hold it out towards the birds. She told Aaron she wanted them to see how beautiful they were. Very strange. But Aaron did know she would love Pidge because she loved everything. To his surprise, his mother said that he could keep the pigeon temporarily because it was sick and we were all strangers in the land of Egypt and it might not be bad for Aaron to have a pet temporarily. The wing was surprisingly easy to fix for the break showed clearly and Pidge was remarkably patient and still, as if he knew he was being helped. Or perhaps he was just exhausted from all the thrashing about he had done. Two popsicle sticks served as splints, and strips from an old undershirt were used to tie them in place. Another strip held the wing to the bird's body. Aaron's father arrived at home and stared at the pigeon, and waited for the expected storm. But instead, Mr. Kendall asked, Who did this? Me, said Aaron, and Noreen Callahan. Sophie, he called to his wife. Do you see this? Ten years old, and it's better than Dr. Belasco could do. He's a genius. As the days passed, Aaron began training Pidge to be a carrier pigeon. He tied a little cardboard tube to Pidge's left leg and stuck tiny rolled up sheets of paper with secret messages inside it. The enemy is attacking at dawn, or the guns are hidden in the trunk of the car, or Vincent DeMarco is a British spy. Then Aaron would set Pidge down 
at one end of the living room and put some popcorn at the other end. And then Pidge would waddle slowly across the room, cooing softly, while the ends of his bandages trailed along the floor. At the other end of the room, one of Aaron's friends would take out the message and stick a new one in, turn Pidge around and aim him at the popcorn that Aaron put down on his side of the room. And Pidge grew fat and contented on all the popcorn and crumbs and corns and crackers and Aaron's grandmother's breakfast rolls. Aaron had told all of the children about Pidge, but he only let his very best friends come up and play carrier pigeon with him. But telling everyone had been a mistake. A group of older boys from down the block had a club. Aaron's mother called it a gang. And Aaron longed to join, as he'd never longed for anything else. To be with them, share their secrets, the secrets of the older boys. To be able to enter the clubhouse shack on the empty lot on the next street. To know the password and to swear the secret oath. To belong. About a month after Aaron had brought the pigeon home, Carl, the gang leader, walked over to Aaron in the street and told him he could be a member if he'd bring the pigeon down to be a club mascot. Aaron couldn't believe it. He immediately raced home to get Pidge. But his mother told Aaron to stay away from those boys or else. And Aaron, miserable, argued with his mother and pleaded and cried and coaxed. It was no use. Not with those boys. No. Aaron's mother tried to change the subject. She told him that it would be soon that his grandmother's 60th birthday, a very special birthday indeed, and all of the family from Brooklyn and the east side would be coming to their apartment for a dinner and celebration. Would Aaron try to build something or make something for Grandma? A present with his own hands would be nice, a decorated box for her hairpins, or a crayon picture for her room, or anything he liked. In a flash, Aaron knew what he would give her. Pidge! Pidge would be her present. Pidge with his wing heeled, who might be able to carry messages for her to the doctor, or his Aunt Rachel, or other people his grandmother seemed to go to a lot. It would be a surprise for everyone, and Pidge would make up for what had happened to Grandma when she'd been a little girl in the Ukraine, wherever that was. Often in the evening, Aaron's grandmother would talk about the old days long ago in Ukraine, in the same way she talked to the birds on the back fire escape. She had lived in a village near a place called Kishinev, with hundreds of other poor peasant families like her own. Things hadn't been too bad for under someone called Tsar Alexander II, whom Aaron always pictured as a tall, handsome man in a gold uniform. But Alexander II was assassinated, and Alexander III, whom Aaron pictured as an ugly man in a black cape, became the Tsar. And the Jewish people of Ukraine had no peace anymore. One day, a thundering of horses was heard coming toward the village from the direction of Kishinev. The Cossacks! The Cossacks! Someone had shouted. The Tsar's horsemen! Quickly, quickly, everyone in Aaron's grandmother's family had climbed down to the cellar through a little trap door hidden under a mat in the big central room of their shack. But his grandmother's pet goat, whom she loved as much as Aaron loved Pidge and more, had to be left above, because if it had made a sound in the cellar, they would have never lived to see the next morning. They all hid under the wood in the wood bin and waited, hardly breathing. Suddenly, from above, they heard shouts and calls and screams at a distance. And then the noise was in their house, boots pounding on the floor and everyone breaking and crashing overhead. The smell of smoke and the shouts of dozens of men. The terror went on for an hour and then the sound of horses' hooves faded into the distance. They waited another hour to make sure. And then the father went up out of the cellar, and the rest of the family followed. The door to each house had been torn from its hinges, and every piece of furniture was broken. Every window, every dish, every stitch of clothing was totally destroyed, and one wall had been completely bashed in. And on the floor was the goat, lying quietly. 
Aaron's grandmother, who was just a little girl of eight at the time, had wept over the goat all day and all night and could not be consoled. But they had been lucky, for other houses had been burned to the ground, and everywhere, not goats alone, nor sheep, but men and women and children, lay quietly on the ground. The word for this sort of massacre, Aaron had learned, was pogrom. It had been a pogrom, and the men on the horses were Cossacks. Hated word, Cossacks. And so Paige would replace that goat of long ago, a pigeon on 2nd Avenue where no one needed trap doors or secret escape passages or wood piles to hide under. A pigeon for his grandmother's 60th birthday. Oh, Wing, heal quickly so my grandmother can send you flying to wherever she wants. But a few days later, Aaron met Carl in the street again, and Carl told Aaron there was going to be a meeting in which a map was going to be drawn to show where secret treasure lay buried on the empty lot. Bring the pigeon and you could come to the shack. We got a badge for you. A new kind of membership badge with a secret code on the back. Aaron ran home, his heart pounding almost as fast as a pigeon. He took Pidge into his hands and carried him out the door while his mother was busy in the kitchen making stuffed cabbage, his father's favorite dish. And by the time he reached the street, Aaron had decided to take the bandages off. Paige would look like a real pigeon again, and none of the older boys would laugh or call him a bundle of rags. Gently, gently, he removed the bandages and the splints and put them in his pocket in case he should need them again. But Paige seemed to hold his wing properly in place. When he reached the empty lot, Aaron walked up to the shack and then hesitated. Four bigger boys were there. After a moment, Carl came out and commanded Aaron to hand Paige over. Be careful, said Aaron. I just took the bandages off. Oh, sure, don't worry, said Carl. By now, Paige was used to people holding him, and he remained calm in Carl's hand. Okay, said Carl. Give him the badge. And one of the older boys handed Aaron with his badge with the code on the back. Now light the fire, said Carl. What? What fire? asked Aaron. The fire. You'll see, Carl answered. You didn't say nothing about a fire, said Aaron. You didn't say nothing to... Hey, said Carl, I'm the leader here, and you don't talk unless I tell you that you have permission. Let the fire, Owl. The boy named Owl went to the side of the shack where some wood and cardboard and old newspapers had been piled into a huge mound. He struck a match and held it to the newspapers. Okay, said Carl. Let get her good and hot. Blow on it. Everyone blow. Aaron's eyes stung for the smoke, but he blew alongside the others, getting from side to side as the smoke shifted toward them and away. Let's fan it, said Al. In a few minutes, the fire was crackling and glowing with a bright yellow-orange flame. Get me the rope. One of the boys brought Carl some cord, and Carl, without a word, bounded twice around the pigeon, so that its wings were tight against its own body. What? What are you doing? shouted Aaron. You're hurting his wing. Don't worry about his wing, said Carl. We're going to throw him into the fire. And when we do, we're going to swear an oath of loyalty to... No! No! shouted Aaron, moving toward Carl. Grab him! called Carl. Don't let him get the pigeon. But Aaron had leaped right across the fire to Carl taking him completely by surprise. He threw Carl back against the shack and hit out at his face with both fists. Carl slid down to the ground and the pigeon rolled out of his hands. Aaron scooped up the pigeon and ran, pretending he was on roller skates so that he would go faster and faster. And as he ran across the lot, he pulled the cord on Pidge and tried to find a place, any place to hide him. But the boys were on top of him and the pigeon slipped from Aaron's hand. Get him, shouted Carl. Aaron thought of the worst, most horrible thing he could shout at the boys. Cossacks, he screamed. You're all Cossacks. The two boys held Aaron back while others tried to catch the pigeon. Pidge fluttered along the ground, just out of reach, skittering one way and then the other. Then the boys came at him from two directions. But suddenly Pidge beat his wings at rhythm and rose up over the roof and to the nearest tenement, up and over Second Avenue, toward the park. 
With the pigeon gone, the boys turned around toward Aaron and tackled him to the ground and punched him and tore his clothes and punched him some more. Aaron twisted and turned and kicked and punched back, shouting, Cossacks, Cossacks! And somehow the word gave him enough strength to tear away from them. When Aaron reached home, he tried to go past the kitchen quickly so his mother wouldn't see his bloody face and torn clothing. But it was no use. His father had came home early that night and was seated in the living room. In a moment, Aaron was surrounded by his mother, father, and grandmother. In another moment, he told them everything that had happened, the words tumbling out between his broken sobs, told him of the present he had planned, of the pigeon for a goat, of the gang, of the badge with a secret coat on the back, of the shack and the fire and the pigeon's flight over the tenement roof, and Aaron's grandmother kissed him and thanked him for his present, which was even better than the pigeon. What present? asked Aaron, trying to stop the series of sobs. And his grandmother opened her pocketbook and handed Aaron her mirror and asked him to look. But all Aaron saw was his dirty, bruised face and his torn shirt. Aaron thought he understood, and then again he thought he didn't. How could she be so happy when there really was no present? And why pretend that there was? Later that night, just before he fell asleep, Aaron tried to imagine what his grandmother might have done with the pigeon. She would have fed it, and certainly she would have talked to it, as she did with all the birds. And then she would have let it go free. Yes, of course, Pidge's flight to freedom must have been the gift that had made his grandmother so happy. Her goat had escaped from the Cossacks at last, Aaron thought, half dreaming, and then he fell asleep with a smile.